Good evening, everyone. My name is Carmela Williams. I'm a member of Shaker Heights City Council and a, the moderator for tonight's conversation. Um, tonight's topic is caring for children and families through COVID-19. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you to our panelists. Um, and, and thank you to the Shaker Heights League of Women Voters, the City of Shaker Heights, Shaker Heights School District, Shaker Heights PTO Council, Hay Shaker, and New One Shaker for bringing us all together for tonight's conversation. Um, before I go on, I'd like to share tonight's format. Um, what we'll do first is go through panel introductions. Um, we'll have an initial set of questions and then we'll end with some questions offered from the audience um, via Zoom or via email. You can send your emails to the email address that is available in the chat bar or chat box. You can also send your questions via the chat. Okay. So um, any questions that are not answered during our time together this evening, um, will be made available to the panelists and they can answer those questions and um, post them along with the um, video that will be available on um, Hey Shakers Facebook and the League of Women Voters page. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our wonderful panel. Um, first up, uh, I'll introduce Lisa Ramirez. Um, she holds a PhD and is the Metro Health's Director of Commun Community and Behavioral Health. Habiba Grimes is CEO of the Positive Education Program. Suzanne Hirsch is Program Manager for the Food Protection Unit at Cuyahoga County Board of Health. Our Shaker Zone, Dr. Marla Robinson is Chief Academic Officer for our school district. And finally, another Shaker, Shaker resident, Gabriella Celeste Cohen, Policy Director for Case Western Reserve University Schubert Center for Child Studies and Co-Director of the Childhood Studies Program. So what I'd like to do next is go back around the horn and ask each panelist to Tell us, remind us who they are, and then tell us about your organization and how your organization is helping families through this period. So let's start with Lisa. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me. I just want to confirm you can hear me okay in the audience. Okay, great. So um, my name is Lisa Ramirez. I am a child psychologist at the Metro Health System. I um, also am director of community and behavioral health, work in the school health program and um, work in our outpatient behavioral health and child psychology psychiatry division. And, you know, I think on this panel represent the um, medical side of the behavioral health piece and trying to meet the socio-emotional needs of children and families. So Metro through the, this pandemic and the um, stress with the pandemic, we have been trying to rally to increase our telehealth capacity so that we can make sure that families are able to access health services, that they're able to access therapists and um, you know, make sure that there's no gap in care. We have unfortunately seen a reduction in pediatric visits and families wanting to seek sort of routine care. And we're wanting to make sure that that doesn't impact health and also making sure that the screening and surveillance that we typically do during those visits isn't missed. We also are out in the community. We have an Institute for Hope that is very active in trying, it, it really is with our social determinants of health, our population health initiatives. So we've been working to try and make sure that individuals and families who initially are quarantined because of a positive COVID diagnosis or an exposure, have access to food, have access to stimulation, whatever it is that they may need for themselves or their families. We've been working hard with our partners within the school health program. We're in several districts and um, work also closely with PEP and are trying to make sure that this summer we are accessing you know, any 
making sure that that we are in communication with the administration so that way as students needs are identified over the summer whether they be um, you know socio-emotional or health needs that we're trying to respond as much as we can and i think at metro we are trying to maintain a relationship with the community and with our partners so that we can provide health and health care and behavioral health care wherever we can given that our mission is the community we're trying to do that the difficulty is that men, much of our community is limited in their access to us and their ability to get outside um, you know so i think there is there are a lot of opportunities and we again are trying to make ourselves as available as possible but no knowing that a large health system and where our footprint is um, sometimes isn't always where people are able to access us. So we are trying to work as closely as we can to get our services out there, to connect um, as much as we can inside the homes, given that right now that's the safest place for people to be. It would help if I unmute myself. Thank you, Lisa. Um, Habiba? Muted. <laughs> Thank you for unmuting me. Good evening. <laughs> Thank you for this opportunity um, to share a little bit about what's happening for young people in our community during this time. Um, I am Habiba Grimes. I'm the CEO of Positive Education Program. We partner with local school districts to educate students with significant and severe social and emotional needs and mental health conditions. And we also provide mental health services in the community for young people who are at risk for displacement from their home, from their community because of significant mental health concerns. Our focus during this time has been continuity. Um, we want to make sure that our young people who we are educating in our day treatment programs are um, able to gain access to academic content that they need so that they don't lose too much ground academically during this time. And continuity of mental health care, mental health services, critically important um, psychotherapy, case management services, intensive case management services and high fidelity wraparound and psychiatry services. Uh, we like Metro needed to really lift up telehealth and make sure that our children, our families had access and continue to have access to critically necess medically necessary and critically necessary mental health services. Uh, and we also needed to make sure that our families have access to digital resources. Um, we will be deploying Chromebooks. We are eager to have hardware in the hands of our children who are in our day treatment centers so that they can gain access to enrichment opportunities and online opportunities that will be emerging this summer. Um, all of this has been a huge lift. The digital divide deeply impacts the children that we serve. Uh, just over 80% of our kids are medical, I'm sorry, ed eligible for Medicaid, which is uh, health care for ind individuals and families, children and families who don't have uh, resources um, and um, access to private health insurance. And um, all of our children are eligible in our day treatment centers for free and reduced lunch. And so we knew and know that there are gaps for them in terms of digital access, hardware access, and we remain committed even during the summer to closing those gaps, closing that divide for our children. Uh, we've named our, our effort bridging the divide um, because it may be very difficult to close it, but we certainly as an organization are eager to bridge it. Um, and then the other thing that we've really emphasized continuity for is relationships. We do provide our school a number of school district partners um, with training and consultation supports. We are an agency that prioritizes relationships between our adult uh, providers, educators, mental health providers. We call ourselves teacher counselors, one and all, and maintaining connectivity to one another, to kids and families has uh, been a priority and remains our priority for this summer. It's by way of relationships that we achieve healing. It's by way of relationships that children learn. And we prioritize those relationships during this time. And we wanna be sure we remain a resource to our district partners as they prepare for the fall, but also as they transition out of this school year. 
one of thing that, one service that's been very successful is a training that we've offered our school district partners in service to the educators caring for caregivers being a resource to them helping them give voice to the trauma and loss and grief that so many of them are feeling with the way the school year ended this year. So we're continuing in that support. Thank you very much. Um, next, let's go to Suzanne Hirsch. Thank you. Good evening. It's Suzanne Rush. I didn't. I didn't mention my last name. Sorry about that. Silent H. My apologies. No worries. No worries. Um, so we at the Cuyahoga County Board of Health have sort of a multifaceted approach. We certainly have clinicians here, both our own doctor, a medical advisor, as well as doctors from Case Western Reserve that we're partnering with, um, and UH doctors, and we're working with them to provide connecting people with testing, especially persons who are under resourced and under resourced communities. And we do some of that testing here. We go offsite. We do a lot with long-term care facilities. And we're providing um, all sorts of education via webinars, uh, our website, and social media. And the central focus for everything we do here at the Cuyahoga County Board of Health centers around an equity lens, right? We want to make sure that the persons least served in the community with the least amount of resources have the most chance. And that includes our students, which we certainly know partnering with healthcare is really important. And um, we work with community health centers, we work with Metro, the Abbas Board. And in this season of schools, with school having been sort of canceled and just school being done remote, it's certainly a challenge. Um, one of the other roles that I do, aside from being a food protection program manager, is work with school environments. I'm the person who works with all the folks that do um, school inspections in our county. And those of you that aren't familiar with the Board of Health, we actually have a partner agency, the Cleveland Department of Public Health, who um, handle everything in Cleveland, and we pretty much handle all the things in the other 58 communities. So we work um, hand in hand as liaison with schools. And we try to make sure that they're afforded the understanding when these new governor's orders come out of what that means to them, what their responsibilities are. And the $64,000 question for everyone is what will look, reopening school look like? And I'm glad that we're focusing on summer for right now, but these ESY end of school year programs and all the special needs populations that have certain learning things that happen every summer we're trying to look at those and make that happen in a way that fits with the governor's orders to protect the health of everyone involved. And that's what we do a lot of, along with investigating COVID complaints and along with answering a COVID call center line Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 4.30. So that's a brief synopsis of what we're doing at the board. Okay, thank you, Suzanne. Uh, Marla Robinson. Yes, thank you, Carmela, and um, to the organizers, thank you for this opportunity to represent Shaker. Um, a couple of my colleagues here kind of set me up for the perfect comments I need to make um, at this point. You know, as a public school system, our role shifted very rapidly um, when schools were closed for students. And for many, many years, we've been more than just about content. We've um, been in the realm of the other side of caring for students. And so my role as a chief academic officer, I'm responsible basically for helping the school leaders help the children. Um, so that's what I do. I don't directly serve students, but I um, work with directors who support principals and those principals work with the schools. And so ironically in March, maybe March 10th, I believe we uh, approved a new strategic plan for Shaker and it's really, um, really uh, rooted in educational equity and basically erasing impacts that have been historically in place in our country around groups. And so we were very proud of that. Um, we have an educational equity policy. And so it's kind of ironic that we actually plan pass that plan in March because that has been the lens that we have used as we have figured out how we serve students even to this day. Uh, yes, our students are not in school. They would not have been in school even for the pandemic because it's summer. However, we have pivoted how we serve students uh, with the pandemic. We did more outreach just to make sure people were okay. We identified families that uh, may be more challenged through um, relationships, as Habiba said, of principals, knowing their families and knowing who might need to be checked on. Um, we are also continuing this work now. So even though um, students are not in session, they would not be in session because it's summer, we still basically have our family community engagement department being there as a resource for families. So we are getting to the place where we want people to know, call us and we will help connect you with the resources that we have in the community. Um, we want uh, families to know that we're here from the, for them. 
Also, we are reaching out to families even this summer that uh, we checked on earlier in the year just to make sure things are still okay, even though it is summertime. So it's not really a time. I mean, it's not normal school, whatever that used to be, but we are still having more connection with families this summer than we would typically have because of the COVID. Um, as Suzanne said, we are in Shaker running in extended school year programming for students with IEPs. We also have some summer school programming that is happening virtually. Also, we are surveying families about what do you need and what do you need even for the fall. So things have changed for us. Um, I'm proud that we have fostered relationships with our families so they see us as a resource and they know that while teachers and everyone may not be in the district, if they get in a, in a tight spot, they are learning that they can come to us and we may have someone that can serve them. And if we don't, we have someone who knows a community resource that can be there for them. And the other place piece we're doing right now is the district is really trying to share uh, information with our families as far as what's out there in the community for families. It's still difficult because um, there are rules in place. You know, we would usually encourage families to take their children to the zoo and to take their children to the museum. Everything is, is not open. And so, you know, knowing child development, we, we do still try to help parents understand it's okay just to go out and take a walk. Like that's an important thing for a child. And so um, right now we are very steeped in preparing for the fall, but we also are kind of in a, a holding pattern, letting the families know if you don't know where to turn, call us and we will find someone to help you with what you need. Thank you, um, Gabriella. Celeste Cohen. Oh, unmute. unmute. Am I now? Can you yes. hear me now? <laughs> hi. Thanks. Thanks, Councilperson um, Williams. And hi, everyone. Um, as a Shaker parent with um, two boys, one left at the high school, I really appreciate um, Dr. Robinson, a lot of the things that you shared with us, as well as everyone on this panel and what folks are doing. Um, our center, we, we, I was actually asked to talk about um, the kind of what policy and advocacy look like during this time for especially vulnerable children. Uh, and I'll just first say that, you know, any advocacy change really will be informed by, ideally driven by the people most impacted by a problem. So I think young people have really demonstrated their power, you know, really most recently in leading this um, important movement for black lives and reform. You know, at our center, the Schubert Center for Studies, a case we bridge research, education, policy, and practice for the well-being of, of children and young people. Our, our policy work relies on credible research and data, um, includes the lived experience of families and young people to guide policy solutions. So in this time of um, COVID, our work has been especially challenging because there's so little precedent to inform our efforts. A lot of this is new territory, and yet um, it also, you know, magnifies existing vulnerabilities and disparities, which um, are too familiar terrain. Um, whether it's our, our health and mental health systems, which you've heard about, or potentially in some of our poorly resourced education um, systems, the child welfare and protection system, our juvenile justice system, too often we find that institutions, even those that are intended to care for our most vulnerable kids, can miss out or worse further traumatized kids. Um, and COVID has actually, you know, it's not no surprise to anyone that it's really exposing these inequities um, so that our most vulnerable children kind of experience, I think, a, a unique kind of harm. So hungry kids are even more food insecure. Um, kids living in homes with domestic violence become even more isolated and risk at harm, especially when we have, you know, few, fewer community members like neighbors or church members, teachers, coaches, um, others who might see them and can intervene. I just learned that our child abuse hotline, for example, in March, 20% fewer, fewer reports compared to the year before. Are these kids really being less abused or neglected? You know, it's unlikely, but it's hard to know. Um, we do know kids are more homebound, right, due to COVID. Um, so, you know, you heard um, Habiba talk about serving kids with mental illness. We know um, kids placed in mental health um, health facilities or group homes um, and our local, local juvenile detention center um, have been unable to see their parents for months now, many of them due to COVID um, precautions that have to be taken. So they have less access to activities or enrichment program, programming. Um, down on Quincy where 
the detention center is, kids who are awaiting a hearing have been um, um, often on lockdown, um, sometimes extended, not just days, but a couple weeks um, with in cells. We, you know, I'm, like I said, mother of teenage boys, these are teenagers with nothing to do. They can decompensate, that can be really damaging. Um, a number of folks don't know that we are actually home to one of the four state youth prisons up on Green Road, uh, the Cuyahoga Hills DYS facility. It's had the largest outbreak of COVID among its youth population. 25 kids have tested positive. That's 30% of their total population. So the whole place is on quarantine. A lot of people don't even think about it. So that's what our center um, and our work tries to do. We, kids whose parents have lost jobs, um, and maybe falling behind on rent or facing eviction um, and homelessness. And, and we, see, we see this, luckily our county had, um, had postponed evictions, but now there's a backlog of 500. And so we're concerned about you know, what that means. Um, and even those who aren't evicted, too many of our kids are plagued with unsafe housing conditions like lead paint in older homes. Um, and so, for example, in Cleveland, one in four kids start kindergarten with a history of lead poisoning. Uh, and those, many of you guys know, um, lead poisoning has life, essentially lifelong harmful effects. Um, and we have, you know, um, kids who've been in the foster system that we work, we've worked with, you know, they, they're often the first to lose their jobs. And these are kids who don't have a family safety net, right? So they don't, and they often don't have savings. So this can be incredibly hard on them. I'm a, Senator um, Lehner and Representative Russo, who run the Children's Caucus in Ohio, just did a, a hearing on this. And Asia, a former foster youth on the call, said, you know, a young person who's about to turn 21, the level of stress and anxiety that is off the charts right now. Um, so how do we look for policies that can extend supports, for example, for kids who would otherwise age out of the supports in foster care? Um, I, so, you know, I could go on. I don't, you know, don't want to be, uh, go, I, I won't go uh, too far here. I'll just say there's clearly vulnerable, you know, children and young people in Shaker and, and greater Cleveland community um, that face potentially devastating um, challenges due to this pandemic. And I would be remiss to say, if I didn't note importantly, that black and brown children are overrepresented in all areas. Um, and in terms of COVID specifically, I, I think people have probably heard the numbers. ODH data tells us that um, African Americans make up 14% of Ohio's total population, but they represent 26% of the 20 of the positive cases in the state. 31% of those who needed hospitalization, 17% of the deaths. So there's a reason why um, you see localities claiming racism as a public health crisis, and we're trying to do something about it. Um, I'll end by just saying that we can do things. Um, I'm happy. There's, you know, I sort of identify. I wanted to lift up four, four things in particular. Um, I don't know if you want me to share those now or wait um, to, to come back to that. But um, I did want to say I, I do have some thoughts about some ways that people should be thinking about supporting these populations. Okay, well, Gabriella, you hold those because I guarantee there will be a question later. <laughs> okay, well, thank you all very much. Um, what I, I think is so important to to folks that are viewing this is that each of you and your organizations are coming at the same problems from different directions or from different starting points, but you all, um, the work you all do complements each other so well. So um, one of the recurring themes that I heard, well, there were several, but one of them um, concerned the importance of connection and then the second would be the anxiety. Um, so um, can you all speak to um, the options that may be available either through your organizations or others that you're aware of for connecting? So we have physical distance, but not social distancing. And let's go with, let's start with Habiba. Thank you. Um, so, so much to say here. I think depending on the needs of the child, identifying what those connectivity op opportunities are. Um, and the first and most important point of connection for kids is the caregiver, the caregiver that's in the home. 
So my, um, my own focus as a parent working from home largely with two young children um, and as someone who advocates for children and children's mental health um, is that we wanna make sure we're caring for those caregivers that those adults themselves have their anxieties managed, have their own any, any existing mental health or substance use or addiction needs, um, that they are connected and resourced so that they can be as, as whole as possible um, as they support their child so much more closely in terms of physical proximity and emotional proximity and without the, the immediate um, and available in-person support of educators and, and mental health providers who might um, have had a routine or had in pre-COVID a routine of engaging those, those young people and supporting that family. Um, beyond this, I think it's important to tap into the resources that are available, the institutions that have been able to maintain um, either virtual or uh, physically distanced in-person um, activities. And, and that again, depends on the needs of the young person, depends on the child's developmental capabilities. Um, but how do we make sure families are connected to those existing resources and, and able to engage those resources at the place where that child most needs them? And for those children whose needs really are significant and require a lot of professional support, knowing that First and foremost, mental health providers are still working. We are essential. We are available. Our referral lines are open. Our crisis lines are open. Our community mental health providers and our health system are here to make sure that those individuals whose mental health challenges, adult or child, are becoming more than that individual can manage or that that caregiver can manage, that there are resources available for those specialized needs. For us, we call that program PEP Connections. We literally are focusing in on connecting those families with the greatest need. But each um, community mental health provider in our community is available and willing to help kids along the continuum of needs that may show up. And adult providers are willing to help adults. I think for those families that have private insurance options, making sure to be in touch with your, your, your network so you know where those resources lie for you and your family is also important. Um, and then I always like to elevate the non-traditional healers. And actually they're probably the traditional healers in many ways, those institutions of arts and culture and faith where you are able to get connected to individuals either virtually in this time by phone, uh, making those contacts and connections and, and finding ways to build out the support that a family needs. Hey, thank you. Um, Lisa? Yeah, I think it's also really important to understand why the relationships, because when we understand why, then I think it helps us think about ways to do it. You know, um, those of us who, who live in the worlds of adversity, childhood adversity and toxic stress, you know, um, stress can be really dangerous when there are not what we call the buffering relationships. And that's exactly what Habib is talking about. So stress in and of itself is not a bad thing. We need stress. And right now it is inherently a stressful time. We should all around the world be experiencing a certain level of stress because there is, is, is a, a threat to us, right? This, this, um, this pandemic. However, the buffering relationships have been shown over and over and over again to be the most important protective factor against the long-term effects of that stress. And so um, the effects of the stress can be multiple. So there are health outcomes, right? So Gabriella talked about the disparity in how COVID impacts communities. And when you have a lot of stress as a child, your immune system gets compromised, a lot of your, uh, you know, neurobiology gets compromised. And so it's actually the stress in childhood makes you more vulnerable in adulthood to heart disease, to diabetes, to obesity, to stroke. And so there's a lot of thought that right now, some of the disparities that we're seeing are a result of both the childhood adversities that have resulted in sort of, you know, this, this health um, 
the, these health outcomes that you're at greater risk and also the environmental things like more crowded spaces, right? More air pollution, not enough sick time to be able to work from home. So those things, but anyway, that's the stress that happens. So I think these buffering relationships wherever they can happen are so critical because we know that's what helps the stress level decrease. That's what helps the cortisol come down, which then starts to protect against a lot of those bad outcomes. So like Habiba was talking about, it starts, and I look at it as sort of like the onion, you know, it starts within the home if we can provide it. And so if we can help to shore up the caregivers, however we can, through policy, through direct contact, that's going to be the most impactful because a stressed out parent is more likely to use stressed out disciplinary methods, right? And or or just not have the ability to make ends meet. And so to be able to meet those household needs, you know, I think Vicki is asking about how can community on the streets and blocks there's a consistency in relationships of people knowing, you know, just seeing a face over and over again and that face saying, hi, if you need something from the store, if, if you need anything, right, if your electricity goes out or your Wi-Fi goes out, right, I mean, some of these people's livelihoods depend on it and in, in certain neighborhoods, it's less, you know, less reliable. So I think we under value how important simple connections can be and the consistent relationships. And so I do, we call them buffering because they do buffer. So I think that Habiba really laid out very nicely where you can find a lot of those relationships and they don't have to be complicated. They don't have to be a psychologist or a therapist. They really can be, and sometimes they need to be something closer to home quite literally or in a school environment where there's a trust because when we know that we've had consistently traumatized communities and, and groups of people, it's very difficult to trust that a relationship doesn't come with a cost, right? And so we're sort of, right now, there are a lot of things sort of converging, but it provides a really good opportunity to try and rebuild trust and also provide those buffering relationships in a way that's going to be meaningful um, and hopefully for those children. So I just wanted to give a little bit of that context. Okay, thank you. Did anyone else want to chime in? Yeah. I, oh, thank ahead. you. Okay. Oh, thank okay. you, Gabrielle. I, hi, it's Suzanne again from the Board of Health. Um, we're talking about how to connect with partnerships. And I think um, Lisa did, did a great job with talking about those buffering agencies. And one of the things in public health, there's been this saying for years and years that sort of hurts our hearts a little bit in our industry. We say public health is the best story never told. People really don't understand what we do and who we connect with. And I, for many of you, Gabriella and Dr. Marla and Habiba, I'm hearing sort of the same themes over and over that you're working with the same people, as you said, Councilwoman, that the rest of us are. So one of the things we can do at the Board of Health, just by dialing that 216-201-2000, we may not be the resource you need, but we can help connect you to the resource you need. And some of these folks on the panel, for example, would be agencies that we would connect with. We provide resources, we speak about partnerships, and even something as simple as what do I do with my child with special needs or immunodeficiencies that wants to be outside and around people, but we have to worry about the threat of contamination. We have some watershed groups. We have some folks at Metro Parks that have already designed a ton of really great programs that we can help connect you with. So reach out to us at the Board of Health at our ccbh.net website or by calling 216-201-2000. And we'll try to connect you with groups that would be appropriate. And again, they're not all founded by us. They're certainly not all run by us, but we'll be the conduit that helps you. And I'm sure some of these agencies could do the same. Okay, thank you, Gabriella. Yeah, if I could add, you know, I think um, there's, a, there's good research out there too that talks about the power of um, the agency and young people engaging in their community. So to Vicki's question and others, and to sort of mental and sort of social emotional well-being, if we can offer opportunities for kids to essentially adopt, you know, their street, adopt their elders, you know, Shaker did that great or is doing that um, great um, thing where you can write a note, you know, to seniors and, 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 and just taking the act of participating and supporting someone else has, of course, these incredibly, um, you know, strengthening benefits for that, for that individual too. So I would encourage us all to look for ways and, or, or again, let young people lead the way as they engage in the community around them because I, that's a real buffering um, practice as well. Thank you. Um, so um, all of you have talked a bit about the different ways to support children and families through this period. Um, and 
um, I wanted to follow up because one of you said something the other day that I thought was, um, it resonated with me. Um, you spoke about um, um, families being in the sense of fight or flight for months now, um, given where we were with dealing with the pandemic, working from home, or trying to find childcare and all of that. And now we're at a period where we're changing gears, so to speak. And so that stuck with me because parents and families are families are transitioning from juggling home homeschool or online school and all of the the stressors and anxiety um, that came with that to now trying to manage the summer. Um, so what I'd like for you all to do is just talk a little bit, um, just chime in about how this looks different now, the summer versus the school year. And if you could, if each of you could put yourself, as I'm sure you easily can, in the shoes of a parent that may be listening to this conversation now, um, trying to manage their kids. And if you could, um, because we have kids that are in different starting places that have different levels of understanding. Can you speak to that a little bit? I'll start if that's okay. Thank you. Go ahead. You know, so what I'm sensing um, is still a um, pretty high level of anxiety from our families and students because we still are in a climate of uncertainty uh, for many of our students and their families and our staff. I need to honestly say there was a significant lack of closure at the end of the school year. And so we did try to do celebrations and things, but there is just um, still a feeling of what's coming next for our family. So if you look at the typical rotation, probably of a, of a family calendar, there's something that summer looks like, whatever that is in your family. You know, for some of our students, we go see Nana or, or we, um, do something during the summer because the schedule is different. And so if we think about what's going on right now, um, we are not educating students as a whole. However, they are not able to enjoy the normal summer activities. So we still see um, just a lot of families um, concerned about how do I engage my child for the summer? Are there ways that I can enrich my child so he or she um, you know, is not as far behind because we did not have regular school in the spring. We did not get everything to our children um, that we wanted. And we know that through the virus, um, as Gabriella said, it basically exacerbated and, and, and put a spotlight on inequities that we already knew exist because this is the United States. So, you know, for us, what we are, are seeing a lot of is a lot of question about what the fall will look like. Um, and so, you know, what we're trying to do is create systems and get information out as soon as we can. I think that, um, you know, what was shared by Suzanne and Lisa is, is also important in that there are small things you can do to reach out to others that make you feel better and make others feel better. And so I think Shaker is a place that's very much a community. It doesn't take a whole lot of work if you have access to get, you know, on Facebook or next door or get on the city website and there's so many um, activities that are happening. So, you know, for example, I know in one neighborhood they wrote the names of uh, African-American men who have been murdered um, through police violence or police brutality on the sidewalks in front of homes through social distancing. So there are lots of little things um, that are out there that can be done. And I think that um, students that are old enough and parents that are able just need to be able to think a little differently um, and, and I hate to say it, but we all have to get a little bit comfortable with things being uncomfortable because that's just where we are right now. Um, and know that that's okay to feel like this is too much to feel like, you know, I really missed my classmates and I'm sad because school didn't end the right way. I'm sad because I didn't get my graduation. So I think there is something to be said for um, validating those feelings in children. I'm one that I believe no matter how small the child is, you talk to them nonstop. That's how they learn. And so, you know, I think that 
for any child to have a trusted adult that they feel like they can talk to that is open, that those things that may seem small, they're really not small. And when we pour into young people a little bit by little bit like that, we make them stronger and we help them. So I know school is not in session, but I can just say that, you know, I was summed up by saying we still see a lot of um, just anxiety with our parents because being the school district, depending on the schedule we put the students on, is going to, of course, affect the parents. If a child of a young age is not in school and the parent now is back to work where the parent might not have been working early in the year, you know, they have to have um, childcare arrangements. So there are a lot of domino effects that we realize exist as we work to serve our families. And so, you know, we're acknowledging that we have an impact in this community and we're working hard to get information out and just trying to let people know, it, you know, it's okay to not have all the answers yet. You know, we can't fix everything. We're a school district. We can't fix everything, but we're gonna do everything we can to do our absolute best for our families and our students. And to the students, if there are any students listening, you know, I would just say, just we're thinking about you. We're working hard. We're trying to find a way to get you in school as much as you, as much as we can with the space and the rules. Um, if anybody has a super connection with DeWine, it would be great if we could get some state guidance, which didn't come today either, because those are the rules that we'll be under and they influence everything that we do. So, you know, I would encourage people to um, be open seek information, get information for yourself so you don't feel like you're left in the dark. And, and, and I think um, I just wanted to say, I, I do think it's important to understand just adjustment wise, we are shifting. I think the first three months of everything very much was that fight or flight. It was survival mode. Everybody, um, you know, bear down and we just had to do what we do. And to see what parents and caregivers were able to accomplish superheroes across the board. I mean, Habiba talked about having, you know, working from home. And I think to manage school, to have to sort of shift to this homeschool, even though it was not truly homeschool, we understand that the educators who were also managing their own children, I mean, just everything that occurred, it was, it was magical to see the ability. And that's what the body does. When you're in survival mode, you survive. However, post survival, then you have to deal with the repercussions of that. You have to, you know, see what bruises happen, what cuts happen? Where are you bleeding? And everybody has bruises. We all have bruises. Um, I think right now we're trying to help focus on adversity is not necessarily a bad thing. You cannot have resilience without adversity. And I think we need to recognize that, right? So adversity in and of itself, just like stress, isn't inherently bad. It's how or if we are come out on the other side with a, um, a new understanding or new way of doing things. And so right now, I think that's where we really need to focus is everybody's going to be bruised and it's going to be different. And the majority will be okay. Who needs a little bit more support? Where is the bleeding happening and how can we identify that? And I think helping parents to understand these are the warning signs. These are the things to look out for. This is a bruise. This is a bleed. You know, really understanding the difference between the two. And we can go into that later if we need to. But I just think it's important to know that we're coming out of survival into adjustment. We likely won't have to do that survival again in the same way. Um, and, and we're going to have time to prepare for what the fall looks like. Um, but this adjustment period is incredibly uncomfortable, like you were saying, Dr. Marla. We have to be okay with the adversity and knowing that the bruises exist. And for most people, they'll, they'll come out, the bruises will heal. Abby, I think you were going to say something. You know, I, I really appreciate the perspective and this opportunity to, to celebrate the caregivers and the educators who got children through this period with as much care and compassion and love as possible. But I do want to just hold up the exacerbated state of stress for our Black families in light of the tragedies that have been witnessed um, on screen, live and in person, um, in some instances, um, for for Black families. And so you know, what I'm hearing and seeing is a certain exhaustion um, and, and, and hopelessness for African Americans who are looking at the conditions of um, police violence and uh, televised death um, and that, that on the heels of this uh, pandemic is, or in the midst of it really, is worrisome to me and makes me also um, just wanna advocate that we be 
thinking about special care <laughs> um, for especially young people, young African-American kids, um, adolescents, our, our black and brown adolescents who are um, looking at the world right now and, and not feeling safe and um, not, not believing that there is necessarily a resolution to the systemic racism that they face day to day have probably verbalized and maybe not been believed. And so that is a, is a particular concern that I have that I think we have to continue to pay attention to. Uh, I think the movement for Black Lives and the movement for justice is a source of uh, inspiration and an opportunity for agency, but we also want these young people to be safe and to survive another day. Thank you. Good point. All good points. Um, um, I would just like to add to what Habiba said. I think some of what we are seeing and feeling is just a combination of the weight of these challenges, um, just one of the challenges alone, as far as the vir virus and what's happening in our nation with the rights of black and brown people, just one of those would be enough. But um, if you look at a family, they may be um, struggling with just the basic day-to-day -day through Corona and then who knows may have a direct contact with what's happened in our communities for black and brown families it really does feel like a, a heavy weight. And I'm sensing some of that with our families and not just our families of color, even some of our families um, that are not families of color, the, the, um, the level of outrage with what has happened and has been seen is, is um, adding to the toll that I see when I interact with families in Shaker. It's just like, um, it's a double whammy, if you will. Thank you, Marla. And you know what, Marla, if you don't mind, I'd like to follow up with you. Um, and all of you, um, given um, the, the impact of the pandemic and the constant stress of systemic racism, do you all feel in education and in healthcare and medical care and addressing environmental needs that this time provides an opportunity to think about how we address all of those things differently. Is this an opportunity to um, evaluate whether or not we can educate differently or provide health services differently to try and address the inequities in all of those systems? Um, for the school district, I would say yes. Um, we know the challenges that exist in the um, public education system in the United States and the virus just basically exacerbated them. And we will be um, serving our families on the different on the other side of this because of things that we have seen that we need to do and that we're able to do. So sometimes it takes a moment to make you pause and say, oh, we really can do this. We really can push a little harder on this. We really can find ways to connect with families that maybe don't um, connect with us very readily. And it may take more manpower, it may take more attempts. Um, I think we've seen um, good results when we have shown people that we truly care and reached out, no matter how hard it was to reach them. Um, and we found that some people we thought we weren't reaching, we were reaching them. So this, this uh, um, showing us kind of like what we're made of and giving us more confidence. As I said, we passed a strategic plan in March that really is focused on basically addressing the impact of racism in our organization. That was before, that was right when everything hit. So I have to say our commitment was already there. I think that the um, coronavirus has also helped people understand some of the disproportionality of things that happen for black and brown people, even if the um, situation with police brutality did not exist. As we look at the data that Habiba just shared around uh, who is impacted by COVID and the um, resulting public health crisis, it just all layers together what comes to the school system and what we must try to address. And so it really does help people who maybe didn't understand our strategic plan really understand why those pieces are in there. And so we, we adopted that, like I said, March 10th, but if you look at the coronavirus and its impact on uh, communities of color and you look at police brutality and its impact on communities of color, if you didn't understand on March 10th, now you really should understand why Shaker Heights City Schools has a strategic plan that it has. So, you know, I'm proud that we were there. I'm not saying we're like, you know, all fixed because we have um, a lot of work to do. But I think this is helping us understand that 
be brave, be bold, we must address these things. Thank you. Did anyone else want to chime in? Yes, hi, thank you. Um, I guess during this time, more than anything, what's obvious to us in public health, we've been planning and preparing for emergencies. I know in my 27 and a half year career, the whole time I've worked there, uh, we've been looking at pandemics and illnesses and we never can anticipate all the little nuances of a H1N1, Ebola, or now a COVID crisis. But the things we're seeing that are pretty much commonplace in any of these emergency situations are, how will people reintegrate and go back to work when work opens up? How will we find daycare? How will our K through 12 kids handle what they have to handle when we're supposedly at work or having to work remotely? You know, How will my kid that's entering college um, from high school find the time and resources to do that when I'm so busy trying to school, you know, teach my younger kids when I'm at home? And how will my young kids that aren't gonna enter college find a job? And this, in this climate, it's just really crazy for a lot of folks with a lot of different you know, balls in the air trying to juggle all those tasks. We really admire the parents. We've always admired the teachers. When we do school inspections, we try to connect with each one in each classroom and tell them we're so proud of the work they do to keep kids safe. But sort of the 10,000 foot view of public health is, is echoing what all of the sentiments of all our panelists are saying. And that is these problems existed long before COVID. But it's like an ugly mirror that we're looking into now when we're really seeing it, right? We already had food deserts. We already had lead paint. We already had bad water and unsafe streams. What we've been trying to do in public health, as all of you have been trying to do, is stop all those problems a while ago. And if there's one good thing, and it's probably the only really good thing that's come out of COVID, is we're able to magnify that now. We're actually able to say, I know I have all these continuity of operation, normal jobs I have to do. We've stopped all of those. We're not doing in a lot of cases, our normal work. I haven't done a food inspection in days and days and days, but you know what? I can go right into a much needed community and do testing. I can look at that zip code map where I know my under-resourced folks are and go right there and actually help them. And that's so heartening for people in public health that we can actually put our money where our mouth is because we're in control of it for once. A lot of times with our programs, we're not. We have all these things that pay the bills that we have to do all the time that don't necessarily focus on the people most in need. So it's really shined a light on what we can do. And, and we've had to form unusual partnerships, you know, radio stations and TV stations and all sorts of folks we don't normally connect with. And that's been amazing. And I hope it influences. And I'm sorry, I forgot which panelist said it, but you said a, a lot of you had said smart things, but this thing really shined through for me. You said that you're asking questions of the people themselves that are most impacted. And a lot of times with public health interventions, we neglect to do that. I, I always heard this premise growing up that you teach treat people the way they want to be, or the way you want to be treated, when actually you should treat them the way they want to be treated. So if we're going to talk to people of color, we're going to talk to minority groups or people with special disabilities, or, you know, anybody that's the them and not the us, right, that we want to be part of us, we've got to get with them and find out their needs and have real dialogue face-to-face -face and engage them. And we're doing more of that because of the pandemic. And that's been an amazing, I watch my colleagues who are so tired who've worked so many hours and so hard and so diligent and every facet from our admins to our health commissioner. And they're so energized to go to work because we're actually able to connect with folks. And we don't want that to stop when the major pandemic has stop. We want that to continue. We wanna hear from you. We wanna talk to you. We wanna be part of forums like this where we can actually answer real time questions for you and let you know that we're a resource. So we wanna keep that going. That's the one positive light out of all this work. Thank you. Lisa, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Echoing both um, Dr. Marla and Suzanne, I think now more than ever, you know, there have been those of us who have been trying to say there are, um, you know, trauma frameworks that don't include racism, as Habiba talks about. There are policy, health policies that inherently discriminate, right? There are young people in schools who are trying to tell us that they're in distress, but because they happen to be black or brown and are acting out, we call them conduct disorder instead of anxiety, right? And so I think there are so many opportunities now while the light is shining to be able to really hold, and those of us in positions of 
academic privilege, right, of privilege, whatever privilege that we have, it is our responsibility to hold our organizations and ourselves to higher standards now because we cannot let things exist as they were, whether it's policy, you know, we have the zoning policies, the economic policies, some of the social policies, whether in healthcare, you know, forcing colleagues to really look at implicit biases because we know right now that, you know, if you happen to be a pregnant Black woman, your outcomes, you know, for delivering a baby are, are worse. And it doesn't matter if you're college educated or post college ed or not, you know, your outcomes are still worse than any white woman. And so things like that are not okay in healthcare. So all of us have an opportunity now in each of our industries or organizations to say we have to do better because now we have no choice but to like some you were saying the mirror the mirror is in front of us and we cannot look away and so um it, it, it many i think you know somebody was saying the other day talking about social media right there was so much um really i think fervor and and emotion with the black lives matter movement and now people are saying but feeds are going back to to what it used to be right it's now and and um i think that those are in positions of privilege get to do that they get to close their eyes and they get to turn around right yet those that have had years and years or their entire lives of having to be um you know really suffering at the hands of the systemic oppression and the racism and, and all and the public health crisis in general they don't they don't get to do that. And so it's really important that that those that can really stand up and um, and really make sure that that people, despite being exhausted from the pandemic, the stress of the pandemic, we cannot allow this conversation to be distracted by other things. It is that important. Lives are quite literally at stake in, in pandemic and also with what we have seen, um, like Habiba said, the, the videos and and everything that's happening right in front of our eyes. Thank you, um, Gabriella. Yeah, well, I couldn't have said it any better. And I think, you know, to, to miss this opportunity would be a true failure on our part as a society. And so um, we've got work to do. We've got a lot of work to do. I, I want to, you know, I, I want to be really clear about some current opportunities that I think are important us to all pay attention to. So, you know, one is, um, especially when I think about vulnerable kids, is um, the census count. Um, it's going on right now, and the census is essential for critical funding supports and services. Um, so please, if you haven't already, you make sure you complete the census, but urge others to do so, um, you know, as well. And the second thing I'd say is vote with our kids at heart. You know, we, um, we need to elect public leaders at the local, state, and federal level who genuinely support policies that help um, all our kids. And it's never been more important. And by the way, young people listening on call, if you are gonna be 18 at the time of you know, November, the, the, the election, please register to vote. And better yet, get other people registered. We need to get that vote out. Um, and you know, it matters because even things like right now, for example, we have the, the HEROES Act, which, which includes in it, which is a relief package act, um, something like something over three billion dollars, I think, or three point six billion dollars, to help ensure that elections will be run effectively in the fall. So it provides funding to local election officials to ensure that voting machines work, that we don't have these big long lines, that you know you invest in voting by mail. Um, so who we have in office supporting those kinds of legislation matters. Um, we've got a, you know a, a bill right now that. Um, is looking at, you heard um, Habiba talk earlier about a lot of the supports um, are funded through Medicaid. Um, you know, if we, there's a package that's looking at the federal government picking up more of the cost of Medicaid so that Ohio, which is currently looking at a huge revenue shortfall because of the COVID pandemic, so we can use our, our dollars to help support schools and mental health programs and other kinds of services. It matters, you know, who's at the federal level supporting that kind of legislation. So your vote matters. Um, and, and, and it matters now, and it's gonna matter even more. So the census voting, the third thing I'd say, and I appreciate Suzanne, you mentioning the um, resource of calling the board, but I, you know, I tell people now, um, use 211, think about 211 instead of 911. If anyone doesn't know about 211, which is United Way Service, um, 
it, it should be our go-to call for resources and supports for ourselves. It's a re resource, it's a referral, you know, phone um, line. And we need to be mindful of when we're calling, you know, police, um, when we could better be um, looking for others for intervention and support. So, you know, we don't, we don't want to be overtaxing the police with things that they shouldn't be doing. And we don't, we, there are things that they're not equipped to do, um, you know, at all. Um, and then finally, I would say things that we could do now is support um, given this time. And I so appreciate Habiba, you know, and Marla and others, but sort of really pointing out the kind of dual tech sort of tech our black and brown friends and families right now, especially. And while I, I experience a kind of pain, it is nothing. I know like the pain that my friends um, of color are experiencing right now, especially parents. Uh, we need to support um, more local black brown organizations that work from a place of strength um, and growth, um, especially during this challenging time. So, so you heard Lisa mention, um, you know, black women, the birthing beautiful communities, a fantastic doula as a program run by Kristen Farmer, um, shooting without bullets, a fantastic arts and activism program run by Amanda King for young people, you know, and gate and it's in a healing. Um, a place for me out of YWCA that works with kids, um, uh, you know, aging out of foster care, and and they they you you know the the nothing about me without me is not just a slogan, you know, for them. Um, cultural exchange down on Larchmere, right, with uh, diverse books and doing literacy programs for kids. We need to support and um, and listen to um, our neighbors and families of color who are leading in this work. I'll stop. I could go on. I'm sorry. Thank you, thank you. Um, I appreciate all that's been said. What I would add is to continue to do the work on ourselves. Um, I've been, I'm so appreciative of Bernie Kerrigan and her uh, advocacy that we work on the racism that exists within us as individuals. That is how we enable change within the institutions that we serve and serve within. Um, and we have been steeped in this and we don't know the true history of systemic racism in this country. Um, I'm a huge advocate for the Racial Equity Institute, the work of Third Space Action Lab to keep that work going. Um, can't suggest strongly enough that individuals in this region get into that two day, the full two day phase one training to understand how we ended up where we are. And what is also important is to kind of look at our disciplines as professionals. What are the discipline? What is the history of racism that's embedded into our disciplines? It's in each and every one um, that that harm was intentional and that that harm um, has had lasting impact. And to begin to shift narratives within our institutions, within our disciplines, within our homes and families, within ourselves about the root causes of the problems that we see. Thank you, thank you. All of that is outstanding information. And if you all are not, if you folks at home, we're all at home to some degree, I guess, but um, if you're following the chat, there's some good information there being shared. For example, um, please go to voteohio.gov and make sure that you register to vote. You update your address or request an application. Um, and also, um, another organization has mentioned Bessie's Angels for Children Aging, children aging Out of Foster Care. Um, so thank you all for sharing. Keep doing that. And thank you all for those comments. Um, so um, I, I know someone is probably sitting out there as much as we want to focus solely on summer. They're thinking about fall. Um, understanding though that the plans have not been announced yet, but what advice do you all have for families that are trying to prepare their children um, for the fall? The, um, well, let me just stop there. What advice do you have for parents and families preparing for the fall? Um, let's start with um, who has something they want to share. Suzanne? Sure, sure, I'll start. Um, well, certainly we understand that 
a few tenets of good public health um, and good schooling. Um, and it'll be interesting to see, by the way, if we do these things I'm about to mention, if we knock down other types of illnesses like norovirus, Campylobacter, E. coli, Salmonella, all the other pathogens, even head lice and even everything, athlete's foot, if we're doing the kinds of things we need to be doing to fight the pandemic, inherently we'll fight some other pathogens or disease organisms as well, right? So there's four or five big things. The first being kids or adults who go to the school that are sick or have symptoms should not be in school. And I'm not just including the pandemic symptoms, which we know there's some weird ones in there now, right? With the loss of taste or smell, the body aches, the malaise or, or fatigue, as well as the shortness of breath, the coughing and the fever. Um, but also this traditional, right? Diarrhea, vomiting, sore throat with fever, jaundice where the skin or eyes are yellow or open lesions on the skin. If people have those symptoms, they shouldn't be at work or school. They should be home and given a call to their primary care physician. If they don't have one, that's a great time, as Gabriella mentioned, for the 211. First call for help for free or low cost insurance, uh, prescription coverage, dental, vision, that whole thing, right? So, first, stay home if you're sick. The good hand hygiene. Frequent thorough washing of hands. And when hand soap and water and disposable towels aren't available, the hand sanitizer at least. The disinfecting of the high touch surfaces, and that would probably be done by more custodial environmental services people the social distancing and the wearing of face coverings. So what families can be doing now is making those the norms in their house wherever possible, right? If you say, don't worry, little Johnny, you never have to do this at the house. It doesn't even matter if you're with great grandma in the car. Well, of course it does matter because little Johnny, as we know, can be asymptomatic carrier, right? So when around our seniors and our immune compromised folks, we wanna show our kids, this is the new normal. And for right now, this is what we're doing. And bring it out of a place of love, right? It's a place of respect. We're caring for all of our neighbors and we're caring, caring for our friends. We're gonna do this to not only protect ourselves, but protect others. At least if we can sort of impose this as normal and not be so militant about it, people get really upset and angry about it, but to work on it from a place of community. If you do nothing else, we could say to people, if you can do these things, it will really help. And if we start there and we sort of make this the new normal, a lot of the other things will be a little bit easier for us. And believe me, all of these panelists, I can tell with the passion in their voice and the passion of my colleagues here at the board, we really care about folks. We're not doing this because we want to impose any harsh things on people. It really is care. And I'm seeing when talking to friends from health districts all over the United States, the folks that didn't social distance, the folks that didn't close down businesses, the terrible, terrible outcomes they're having. So I know there's a lot of worrying back and forth about how it hurt business or helped business or hurt our kids or helped our kids. But let me say this, look at the statistics for Texas and for Louisiana and for Florida and for the folks that refused to do what our governor and Dr. Action did and they're, they're hard pressed. So that's what I think, at least in brief, how we can start to prepare. I would um, just like to echo what Suzanne said. Um, even though we don't have final rules um, from the state, we know that the protocols that she just described are going to be in place um, when we begin school. We're working on making videos to communicate to students and how do we teach them these expectations. But just like any other skill that we expect the students to demonstrate when they come to school, if it begins at home, it's a whole lot easier. Um, I would also say, you know, it is not uncommon, and I understand why it happens for young children to have a fever or be sick and we load them up with medicine and we send them on their way because somebody has to go to work. You know, in this situation, and like um, Suzanne said, not just because of Corona, that's really problematic. Um, that's really problematic because of the virus and other things that the kids can catch. So, you know, I understand that sometimes it's difficult to find ch child care, but um, just would encourage families, if a child is beginning a sickness, it's better for everybody to just find a way to keep them home. And here's the thing, if they come to school, typically, three or four hours, whatever they took in the morning wears off and they're sick again and, you know, they don't feel well and they're cranky and then someone has to get them home. So I would say, you know, the more you can talk to them and put these protocols in place at home to the degree you are comfortable and as appropriate for the age of your child, it will help them have a smoother transition when we restart in the fall. Thank you. Oh, go ahead, Fifa. Um, I just want to add, this is an opportunity to practice grace and patience. Um, and as Suzanne has said, Dr. Marla has said, uh, this is a, a, we are 
doing this on purpose as educators, um, our district partners, as, as school systems, that this really is the most unusual circumstance we've seen in our lifetime as it relates to continuity of the public school system in the midst of this pandemic. So grace and patience is something that I often kind of elevate with my staff um, and when within my own family, self-compassion and then compassion for others as these decisions are, are worked through. And, keeping our contact with our, our district, um, school districts for us um, who are awaiting news from the school district, read the emails that come. Um, and also for those who are, are working with additional providers or supportive services, just staying in contact, staying connected so that you can have clarity if things are coming through that you don't understand, or if you need more information and are looking for a little assistance. And then um, I would say that um, given all of the uncertainty, I think some really simple things that families, caregivers and families can focus on to help prepare, um, don't underestimate the importance of things like sleep. You know, I know that sleep has gotten many of my adolescents, especially my adolescent patients, they, you know, they're getting their, their 10 hours of sleep. It just happens to be between 1 a.m. and 11 a.m., you know? And so as we start to think about shifting toward a, a school schedule, I think sleep, really focusing sleep impacts so many things like immune system, like mood and ability to be patient and, and to tolerate changes. And so um, I think sleep is really important. I think focusing on, on good nutrition because it also impacts things like immune system, um, trying to get activity, physical activity, and a little bit of exercise, providing some structure within the home. You know, a lot of these things, it pains me to say it in some ways, because when I say things like exercise, we know that green spaces, you know, um, obviously when we're talking about inequity, people with, you know, who live in, in more suburban areas, you know, who have more privilege tend to have more access to the green spaces to be able to do the exercise. But even if it's taking a walk or trying to be active within the home, doing a dance party, there are free yoga um, sites. You know, I, I can't remember the name of the site. I'll, I'll put it in the, I'll think about it and put it in there, but it's free YouTube videos for younger kids that um, cosmic kids yoga, that's what it's called. And it's really fun for younger kids. Um, you know, so really, I think, not forgetting about those foundational things that are so important for child development in addition to just trying to be present. Children don't need perfect parents. They need good enough parents. There's no such thing as a perfect parent. And good enough is exactly what Habibu was saying. The grace, the patience, you know, um, Suzanne was saying, you try and keep them as healthy as possible and, and really trust that the Suzannes and the Dr. Marlas and are, are really working together to do the best job they can to keep your child safe. Um, and you focus on really trying to, to, to maintain that household so that that buffering relationship exists in there and setting them up for success with those things I was talking about, the sleep and routine. Okay, thank you. Oh, that was all good, good information. Um, so when we think about um, following up on what Habiba and Lisa just spoke of this grace and patience and um, the fact that children don't need perfect parents. They need good enough parents. I like that. So one of you mentioned earlier about checking in or talking with the kids, making sure that you talk to them, you pour into them. Um, I imagine one thing that's important is helping a parent helping a child process um, as much as they can about what they're feeling and being able to express that. Can you all speak to or give some advice to parents on how to do that? Because we're in a space that none of us have been in before, where we've got social unrest, we've got a pandemic, and we've got all of the anxiety that comes with that. So what advice or what suggestions do you have for parents about how to have those conversations to check in with their kids? I can start us off um, by saying that one, you have to really think about the developmental level of your child, right? Younger kids still have that really deep connection with their caregivers and they're really looking to the caregivers to help prime and model um, what the reaction is gonna be. And so I know some of the panelists before have mentioned about caregivers making sure that they have support because 
being able to talk, I mean, just imagine, right, and I'm dramatizing a bit for effect, but imagine having a conversation with a three-year-old about having to wash hands or wear masks or go out in public, and as a caregiver, you're crying, you know, because you are so stressed out. That three-year-old is going to pick up on those tears and that stress, you know, if, and, and I'm not, I have had my own tears, right, in all of these, so I'm certainly saying that it's not, but but I try to, with my, you know, four-year-old, have a little bit of, you um, try and use a little bit of distraction or just use developmentally appropriate language and really try and model that even if I'm stressed out or I'm worried, there are things we can do, right? As, as children get older, they don't need necessarily that type of modeling and that type, type of containment. And, and at some point it shifts from doing the modeling to really being the listening. And I think especially with our adolescents right now, obviously if they're asking questions, you know, you wanna be available as a parent to answer and as a caregiver to answer those questions. And I think also what we have to do as caregivers of the older um, children is really pay attention to what's happening. Um, sometimes adolescents don't really understand the distress that they're feeling. And I know um, we have in, in Cleveland in general, in Cuyahoga County, we have especially high rates of depression, of anxiety, of suicide. And I think that as caregivers in that adolescent phase, we want to be paying attention to distress. And if it feels like it's overwhelming, and that's where we want to kind of be careful about that. Um, and really, if you see changes in your child being able to access. The conversations, I think, should be truthful and honest at what your child can handle. Um, you know, and again, really making sure that you as a parent, as a caregiver, are trying to manage your own um, anxieties and really uh, making sure that you're comfortable having those conversations. And even if that means limiting media, because we know that, especially when the pandemic was, high, and now when they're talking about all the increasing numbers, I keep getting text messages from people saying, is this really real? Um, you know, are these, are we going to, be shutting down. And so I think trying to, to manage all of that as a caregiver is going to be really important to provide that good enough parenting and a space for your child to come and feel safe processing through those emotions. But understanding those changes um, and reaching out to, to maybe your school or your pediatrician or mental health agency, whoever it might be, if you have concerns. And there's also, there's certainly the county hotline. Um, 216-623-6888, which is frontline, if you have concerns that your child might be depressed or having some suicidal thoughts, um, really important to try and, and provide support right now um, when there's not a lot of that social contact that adolescents really need so much of. Okay. Thank you. Did anyone else? Oh, go ahead, Lisa. Uh, I echo and, and have gratitude for Dr. Ramirez and agree with all that she said. The one thing I would add is um, self-monitoring and, and, and active monitor monitoring of young people's use of devices. Um, many of us, no matter our, our training, background, so on, can fall victim to dissociating into devices, screens, um, and dissociation is a, is a mechanism for managing stress. It can be a healthy mechanism for managing stress but it can also be a disruptive and um, destructive way of managing stress. And so putting down our devices becomes really important as adults. So we are present with those children, no matter their age or stage. Um, student, young people who have verbal abilities, the ability to verbalize what they're feeling um, at a, even a young age, if you're listening, if you're present with them, especially in parallel, they'll elevate the thing that's bothering them or that they're worrying about and they'll ask questions or they'll just, they'll say what they're feeling. Um, and it's an opportunity to soothe, to comfort and remind young children, especially that the adults are here to care for you. The adults are here to keep you safe. Um, and for adolescents, it's an opportunity to really process some of the abstract and um, um, cognitive needs, concerns, questions that they have um, when we are able and available. So I would, I would caution too, because so many of us are working from home, we may not have good kind of work hygiene, so to speak, and that we have a point where like we close the computer and we shift into our at home and family self. And we have to be conscious to do that. Uh, so that when device, so that devices aren't interfering even for work and professional needs with our ability to be present with our kids. Okay. 
Thank you. Okay, so we are about at the 10 minute mark. So um, I want to make sure that each of you have an opportunity to close us out. You know, so I'll ask um, if you could take each of you take a couple of minutes to just share something that you want um, the viewers to take away with them. Um, and we can start with Gabriella. Thanks. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I, there's just so much, just uh, terrific advice. I was like trying to take notes for myself. I'm glad this is going to be taped, right? So I can go back and practice grace. Remember that we're models for our children, you know, right? Um, you know, I think if there's one thing I'd like to leave folks with, it is to um, consider maybe a, a, a narrative about this time that is, is that it's a really powerful time. And that, and that, Power is, can, can manifest in lots of ways. And so how do we tap into that? How do we support our kids in, do, in tapping into that? How do we, you know, it, how do we hold ourselves and our community responsible for, the, for this time and to make the most of it? And, um, and I just, and, and we need to do that as both individuals we've heard in our families, in our community, and we need to expect that of our leaders. So that's what I'd leave with folks. Thank you. Um, let's go with Lisa next. Okay. Um, I think I just want to, again, I want to leave on a note of hope. I want to highlight again that adversity doesn't mean that we are, are, that we have to be crushed. I think that we have to focus on the things like gratitude. And so finding, I love Gabriella's point about trying to understand this is a powerful time, finding the things that we can be grateful for in our homes, in, in our circumstances, in our state, whatever it might be. Um, and I think trying to, to instill that practice and, and try and make it a habit can be really, really powerful. I think it's really important that caregivers are feeling supported. And so finding a way to reach out to whatever, whatever buffering relationship it might be, whether it be a religious organization or the school or a neighbor, um, your block. Uh, and, and so really trying to establish those relationships because unfortunately this is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And so while we might be um, out of one of the survival modes, we're still going to be running for a while and we're gonna be exhausted for a while. So finding ways to do that self-care for ourselves to model that and so that our, our children start to see that as well, that it's okay to be hurting and, and to be distressed and to be anxious as long as we have ways to be able to handle and deal with that. Um, could say a lot more, but I'm just gonna leave it there for now. Thank you. Suzanne? Sure. So um, patience, empathy, kindness, all those words that we throw around. But in this case, I think you're all echoing those sentiments. Really important um, that we lose assumptions about others, right? Whether it comes to the race equity piece or as simple as, you know, the person we think's hoarding because they have a ton of toilet paper and sanitizer in their cart and we happen to think it's too much. And then we come to find out as we listen to them in the line that they're bringing it to all their senior neighbors in their building, right? So not just at face value, looking and making that assumption, but stepping back and go with a, a view of kindness. And when we talk about adults, I think after 9-11, we learned some valuable lessons about the media and the social media and the hype and what we have to do to protect our children and our families. And one of the things is for separating parenting and work life, adult life from what we do with our kids, because it really is a reflection and the children pick up on it. And I remember, something poignant from 9-11 when a mom was crying watching the TV and her very small son was watching her crying. He didn't know why she was crying. He was too young to understand what was on the TV, but he understood mommy was hurting. So the more that we could support each other and support our kids and be there for them, the better off we'll be. Thank you. Um, Habiba. Uh -huh. um, I want to echo the sentiments of resilience that uh, Gabriella and Dr. Ramirez elevated. Each of us as individuals, as part of our family systems, as part of our cultural groups, and as part of our institutions have histories of resilience, of survival, of, of pure strength and um, 
over the ability to overcome adversity. So my hope for us as we continue in this time is that we will tap into that history, tap into that legacy of resilience and help that allow it to propel us forward in each of those aspects of our, our identities that we, we live with. Thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Robinson. Okay. Um, I just, I echo everything the, the women said. I will, I'll tell you why it resonates for me. For me, I go to work, of course, by crossing this hall in my house every single day for the children that I serve. And I think it's really critical that the adults really practice high level self care because what they do, every little thing they do impacts the children they interact with. And so I think there are times when any parent or guardian feels overwhelmed and you feel like you're just trying to keep all the pieces together but I just urge people to take that moment and do whatever it is they need, like Dr. Lisa said, to manage the natural coming on of stress so that they can be a better parent or guardian because our children are like little sponges and we have to be very cognizant of how our words, actions impact them. And I know there are still corners of this community where people are hesitant to seek professional help and I just can't say enough that that's not okay. You need to do that. You need to do whatever you need to do to take care of you so you can take care of the children. Um, for me as an educator, probably more than 30 years now, that's the thing that just really gets me. Students have no choice in many matters and the choices of adults have everything to do with what happens with those children. So I would just speak to all the caregivers and say, do whatever it takes to take care of yourself. So you can take care of the students. And I don't mean just shaker students. I just mean children, period. Even if that means getting out of your comfort zone and picking up the phone and calling for a professional help. Just okay, don't, don't suffer alone. Michael Barron, and I keep laughing every time I say that. Yeah. So um, I just wanted to say that that's, that's what's important to me, that people take away that these are difficult times. It's very overwhelming um, on many fronts. I mean, at least in the coronavirus aspect, at some point, science will come up with a vaccine. You know, it's unfortunate we can't come up with one for what's happening to black and brown people and racism. Um, so there will be a stress that's always there, but I really need the adults to do what they can to take care of themselves so that um, our children can thrive. Okay, thank you, thank you all. Oh, go ahead, Suzanne, did you want to chime in? Nope, I accidentally- Okay. <laughs> Okay, so I just wanted to check, see if there were any questions that came in. And since there's not, I wanted to thank each and every last one of you. Um, Suzanne Brush, Dr. Marla Robinson, Habiba Grimes, Lisa Ramirez, and Gabriella Celeste Cohen. Um, you all were fantastic. Um, you provided some great information and I hope that everyone took away at least three things that will help them get through this period. Um, one of which is to, to um, have grace, <laughs> to be kind, and to definitely understand that you don't have to be perfect and you're not alone. Um, so um, again, I'd like to thank everyone for helping to make this happen, including the League of Women Voters and um, everyone that took some time out of your evening to share in this experience. So grateful for all of you. I think that's it. So you all have a good night. It's been a thank pleasure. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>